So Bill Self, who was a pastor for over 40 years, describes how he and his wife, Carolyn, were in London to participate in a conference. They were walking near Buckingham Palace and noticed a church. Actually, it was a shell of a church. It was being rebuilt. There was nothing left but four walls, no windows, doors, or pews. Scaffolding was up inside the walls, and craftsmen were eating their lunch in the nave. Around the church was a chain-link fence with barbed wire across the top. Near the opening that served as a door was a very large sign with these words written for all to see, Danger! Enter at your own risk. Of course, those words were designed to protect the general public from construction accidents, but when Pastor Self saw that sign, he thought of the many church people, both ministers and lay people who had been chewed up by the church and would testify to the truth of that sign because church can be tough. Enter at your own risk. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about how Paul wrote 2 Corinthians after a painful time. Many Christians in Corinth and the church that Paul had founded had turned against him. They had been biased by a set of teachers that Paul ironically calls super apostles. Seeing his own converts reject him was heartbreaking for Paul, but he was determined not to let it destroy him. He says, since God has so graciously let us in on what God is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and just walk off the job. No way, we're not giving up. Yet, despite his determination, in a rare moment for Paul of personal vulnerability, Paul uses this image of a clay jar to acknowledge his own deep flaws and failings and the difficulty that he has faced in ministry. It's one of the most expressive images in all of Scripture. Paul sets up this vivid contrast between a priceless treasure and its container, an everyday clay jar. I love how Pastor Eugene Peterson translates this passage in the message version of the Bible. He writes, We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. In the ancient world, coins were often buried in clay jars for safekeeping. It's kind of like what happened in the Depression here in the U.S. when the stock market crashed in 1929 and Americans felt really nervous about the banks. And as a result, people started hiding money in their homes. Bed mattresses were, of course, a favorite place to hide things, as were attics, but people got creative, too. They cut holes in the walls of their homes, and they hollowed out the chairs, uh, the legs on their chairs and their pianos, and they would secure their money and cash in those places. As recent as 2006, In Ohio, a contractor who was remodeling the bathroom of an old home found $182,000 in Depression-era currency hidden in the wall. I'm not sure how you forget you have $182,000 in your wall, but apparently people do. So in the ancient world, particularly during times of war and instability, people would bury coins in clay jars for safekeeping and apparently forget where they had buried them because archaeologists have found literally thousands of coin hoards, that's what they call them, throughout the Greco-Roman world. In fact, the image on the front of your bulletin is a real image of when they found a coin hoard That was found in Aberdeen, Scotland in 2014. So this phenomenon of burying coins was so well known that Jesus tells a parable about it. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says, God's kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field for years and then accidentally found by a passerby. The finder is so ecstatic that he proceeds to sell everything he owns to raise money to buy the field. 
the Greek word for treasure, which Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 13, is the same word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our passage for today. So even though Paul is speaking, metaphorically of course, perhaps a coin hoard is the image that he has in mind when he says, but we have this treasure in clay jars. So he sets up this brilliant contrast between priceless treasure and its container, an everyday clay jar. If you think about a clay jar, now these are quite lovely. We needed some ugly ones mixed in, but these are quite lovely. But if you think about a clay jar, it's fragile. It often has cracks and chips and scratches. If you drop it on the floor, it will shatter. It's a metaphor for human vulnerability in contrast to the power of God. So Paul is deeply conscious of the treasure that he carries within. He understands that he is privileged to be a messenger of Jesus. He wouldn't trade it for anything. Paul says, I'm not going to give up. But that doesn't mean it isn't hard. He's emotionally honest and vulnerable about how difficult his calling has been in the passage. He talks about being hard-pressed, surrounded by troubles. He talks about being perplexed, meaning confused. I didn't think Paul was ever confused, but apparently he was. He has been persecuted, he says, mistreated. And finally, he confesses to being struck down, which scholar Paul Barnett says probably means in our language, depressed. Sometimes Paul feels vulnerable, like a clay jar chipped and cracked. These are not words of glory, but of struggle. In other words, danger. Enter at your own risk. Paul reminds us that any difficulty or trouble or hardship that the church faces today didn't start with the modern church. It's always been with us. Pastor Self says it's helpful to remember that they crucified Jesus. They didn't elect him chairman of the board, right? Kingdom work, church work is tough, demanding, and frustrating. It has its rewards, but it's certainly not for the faint of heart. We want to focus on the treasure, the priceless treasure of the kingdom of God, but in reality, we spend a lot of time dealing with clay jars. So remember this, don't forget this, despite the flaws, the cracks, the vulnerability of humanity and of the church, God chose us. God chooses to work in and through people, bringing them to faith and calling them into service, working through us to bring life to others. It's hard to carry this message of Jesus and to live out his love. We feel discouraged, yet we remember that we are clay jars, sometimes fragile, broken, and imperfect. However, the great thing about a clay jar, what I was thinking about this week about clay jars, is that they can be filled up, right? When we feel empty or discouraged or perplexed, we invite the Holy Spirit to pour into our lives and into our church. The whole point, after all, of Paul's metaphor is that it's about the power of God in the midst of it all. He says, we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God. So this morning, I want to give you a moment of silence, an opportunity to pray and think about what do you need God to fill you with. Take this time to invite God to pour into your life and into the life of our church. And then in just a moment, I will pray for us.
Will you pray with me? God, we are the clay, and you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. We are strong and courageous, yet also flawed and fragile. In our strength and in our weakness, God, make the life of Jesus visible in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of commitment, number 669, God of grace and God of glory. And as we stand and sing this morning, I'll be here at the front if you need prayer or if you're interested in becoming a part of this fellowship. I'd love to speak with you as we stand and sing. At this time, we give our gifts back to the God who has given us so much. <laughs> 